Howdy people, thanks for checking in to MrUlrichsLandOfBiology.com. I am Mr. Ulrich. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at some of the ways that people have applied our knowledge of genetics and heredity to get things done. Now this isn't a new thing. People have been using the principles of heredity for a long time, certainly long before we understood uh, the molecular background to it. Um, but now that we do know quite a bit more about how genes work and even how heredity works, uh, we can certainly do some pretty neat stuff. People have known for a long time that traits are passed down from one generation to the next and they've been using that knowledge uh, for centuries uh, through a process called selective breeding to domesticate animals to get uh, plants and animals to have the traits that they're looking for and a pretty pretty basic pretty simple process just going out there and saying uh, seeing which traits are the ones that are desired in the next generation finding those individuals amongst the population that have those traits and using those as breed stock for the next generation uh, what this guy here is doing is he's sexing the chicken. If you're going to breed chickens, you've got to make sure that you have males and females. Uh, and it's not as easy from uh, the outside <laughs> to see. You have to take a pretty darn close look. So that's what that guy is doing. Uh, now, uh, if we're going to choose organisms that have the best traits, that kind of implies that all organisms are not the same. And of course, we're talking about uh, all organisms not the same within within a population or within a uh, species. Uh, there there are inheritable differences between organisms and uh, individuals, and we call these inheritable differences variations. If you're thinking, wait a minute, selection variation, and your brain is going ding 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 ding. Wait a minute, did we talk about this in evolution? Yeah, there is a pretty striking similarity here between natural selection and selective breeding. Uh, in natural selection, it's the environment that's deciding or choosing which traits are beneficial. Whereas in selective breeding, it's a breeder who is determining which traits are beneficial. Those traits might not be beneficial to the survival of the organism in the wild. And that's how we end up with uh, domesticated pigs with ears that are so big that they hang over their eyes and they can't see. Uh, traits like this certainly wouldn't persist in the wild, most likely. Now we know that traits run in families, so if we are choosing uh, individuals that are going to mate, that are going to you know, uh, contribute to the next generation, and we're choosing them based on traits that they have, well, since those traits tend to run in families, there's a good chance that those individuals are going to be related. Uh, and when we, when, when, when we choose individuals that are closely related, we call that inbreeding. Now, a lot of people have a kind of visceral reaction to inbreeding. The first thing they think of are these gross abnormalities, physical uh, uh, abnormalities, uh, oddities that come from inbreeding. And, and they often will even think of it as um, inbreeding as a mutagen, like it's going to cause some sort of mutation. And that's not the case. Uh, inbreeding does not cause spontaneous changes in uh, the DNA base pair sequence. What it does do, however, is it does increase the chances that we're going to have um, offspring that are homozygous recessive. So if we choose individuals that are closely related, there's a good chance that those two individuals might both be heterozygous for a particular trait. And if those two individuals are heterozygous for a trait, there's a 25 percent chance that the offspring are going to be homozygous recessive. Now in the case of blue eyes, something like that, not a problem. But quite often these recessive traits, since they do come from the lack of a protein, sometimes that can be a problem. We like to think that our proteins all have functions. So if you're missing one of those proteins, uh, we may have issues. So inbreeding, something to be avoided. It's probably why we have the trait as a population, as a human population, um, of thinking that it's gross. That kind of keeps us from having these, uh, increasing the chance of homozygous recessive traits coming out in our populations. Now, that is not necessarily the norm for all other organisms. Uh, inbreeding is relatively routine in, uh, uh, out there in the plant and animal kingdom. 
The term hybrid gets used in quite a few different ways. Uh, now, uh, we can drive hybrid cars. That has two different drivetrains, electric and gas. We can be hybrid for a particular trait. That's going to have two different alleles uh, for that trait. Um, but in this case, we're talking about breeding. So what are we talking about as far as a hybrid here? Sometimes people recognize that uh, the traits that they want in one organism happen to be found best in two separate species. Uh, so in some cases, very rarely, but in some cases, we can actually mate those two different species together. The cool thing that happens is quite often we get what's called hybrid vigor. Um, you actually get an amplification of those traits that we were looking for. Uh, this case is really clearly shown in the mule. All right, um, a mule, like we talked about back uh, in a unit on classification, a mule is a hybrid between a donkey and a horse. And um, somebody said, "Hey, I want the." Uh, I want the endurance of a horse and the strength of a donkey together in the same organism and lo and behold you end up with a mule which is in some ways uh, has more endurance and is stronger than either the horse or the donkey. Kind of neat. Now the drawback here of course is though they are close enough related to mate um, they are not close enough related to mate and have babies that can make more babies that can make more babies. So we can put mules together, boy and girl mules together, Jacks and Jennies, um, play as much Barry White as we want. We're not going to end up with any baby mules. So up until this point we've been talking about selecting which organisms are going to go ahead and mate and pass their genes on to the next generation. We also know that uh, this, there's no guarantees when it comes to uh, inheriting particular traits from parents. Now with genetic engineering, these modern, using modern technology and uh, our modern understanding of molecular genetics, um, we can actually get in there and manipulate individual genes and get them to do what we want. Several years ago, up in Scotland, the University of Edinburgh, a team of researchers were able to uh, clone in a sheep using a, a transnuclear cloning technique. Now, what we mean by transnuclear is we're going to switch nuclei. So what they did is they took a body cell from the udder of one sheep, took the nucleus out of it and threw the cell away. We don't need the cell. All we need is the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus of every one of your cells and every one of the sheep cells, except for the, uh, the uh, sex cells, are going to have a complete set of DNA, a complete set of all the genes necessary for all of the structures in the body, all the proteins in the body. Uh, so we take that nucleus out of the body cell, took an egg cell from a completely different strain, a uh, different breed of sheep, took that egg cell and took the nucleus out of it and threw that away. Don't need that, egg, that nucleus anymore. All we need is the cell. Took that nucleus from the body cell and stuffed it into the um, egg cell and gave it a little pulse of electricity and sure enough that egg cell uh, with the new nucleus in it divided, formed a morla and went on his merry way and eventually we had a new sheep. And of course that sheep was uh, genetically identical to the donor and had n really no, no relation to the, other than its sheepness, uh, no relation to the, um, the egg donor. And this is what we call reproductive cloning. Now invariably students will ask me, do we clone people? Well, sort of. Uh, therapeutic cloning is used uh, not just on people, but it is used uh, with human cells. And uh, this is how we keep germ lines uh, of uh, stem cells going, uh, by taking those cells and uh, growing them in tissue culture and using those cells uh, to do research with. Even with cloning, we're still dealing with a whole genome. So we haven't quite gotten down to the gene level yet. Now we can. When we get into uh, individual genetic engineering, um, we're going to talk a little bit more here about uh, what we call recombinant DNA. So if we're going to take a gene from one organism and put it into another, um, that genetic material is going to be recombined with that genome and we're going to refer to that as recombinant DNA. 
back in the day, I, I don't know how many of you guys are old enough to remember this, but um, we used to listen to tapes all the time. And quite often, as you're driving down the road, listening to your fabulous new Tribe Called Quest album on cassette, you'd be ro rolling down the road, and of course the tape would get eaten. And you pull the tape out of the cassette player, and it's all crinkly and gross. And what we'd have to do is cut the crinkled section of tape out and tape the ends back together again so that we have one continuous piece of tape. And we can think of DNA a lot, like... Uh, cassette tape tape right it's uh, linear it remembers uh, information in a long string and different sections of the tape are going to be individual songs we can even break it down to individual bars of songs and back before people used uh, cool and groovy software like Fruity Loops and GarageBand and some of these other things to um, make uh, repeating loops of uh, short pieces of music laying cool beats over top of them and uh, making music that way we still could do that we just didn't have the digital way to do it we had to actually take a section of tape find just that portion of tape that had the music that we wanted on it cut that out tie, uh, tape those ends together into another loop and put that back on the tape machine and that would play over and over and over again and we called that that was splicing now um because it's so similar to working with genes, we refer to it as gene splicing. When I was repairing my cassette tapes, I would usually use scissors or sometimes even a razor blade. Um, but we can't use that on DNA. So what are we going to use? We're going to use what are called restriction endonucleases. These are special enzymes, um, and their job is to cleave the DNA. But they do it in a pretty special way. They do it... Uh, not straight across the two chains. They're actually going to cut it in a way that's going to leave a few of those bases uh, unpaired. And those unpaired bases, well, they really want to pair with their complements. And so that turns them into kind of uh, sticky ends. And if we use the same restriction endonuclease on different pieces of DNA, well, that means that they're going to have the same sticky ends. And now we can start to rearrange and splice the ends of those uh, DNA parts together. Now these restriction enzymes are also used in gel electrophoresis, if you remember way back when we talked about this. Back in the beginning of the school year we did our unit on tools of the biologist. We did talk about gel electrophoresis, so just to refresh your memories, uh, gel electrophoresis, electrophoresis is a way to uh, separate um, and sort different sized particles of DNA. So how do we get the different sized particles? Well, we'll start out with uh, a big long string of DNA and we'll use a particular uh, restriction enzyme to cut it into little pieces. And that will yield um, DNA of different sizes, little fragments that are different sizes. We take that combination of that mixture of fragment sizes and put them in the well, in one of the wells, turn on the power and that's going to cause the particles of DNA to move through the gel. The larger poly uh, molecules, because they are bigger and clunkier, don't go as far. And the smaller particles, which uh, can move faster, actually go further through the gel. And so that starts to spread, th spread them out and sort them by size. Now the way this is then used, this is used uh, most famously on the Maury Show uh, to determine who's your daddy. The idea is if two people are closely related, that means that those um, restriction sites, the order of bases that that particular restriction enzyme will cut at, those restriction sites should be in similar places if our DNA is similar. And that means that and when we use the restriction enzyme, we're going to have similar sized fragments and that would show up on the uh, gel electrophoresis as similar banding patterns. Us humans, we're, we're pretty crafty in the laboratory. We can do a lot of things. One of the things we can't do, however, very well is make proteins. Certainly make specific proteins. Um, from scratch. So taking uh, individual amino acids and gluing them together in just the right order to get the properly shaped protein that's going to do what we want to do, we're not very good at that. What we are really good